Welcome everyone to Tech About Live. Please, I, I deeply, sincerely apologize for the delay. Um, our original moderator was not able to make it to the call and we had to, you know, work very quickly to get me on here. Um, this is an event that we put together to discuss um, technology and innovation trends in Africa alongside industry experts. Um, and today we're going to be talking about logistics in Africa, what the future of logistics is in African markets. Um, Tech About speaks to both the business and human impact of technology and innovation in Africa through high quality articles, reports, and events such as this one. We also publish the TC Daily newsletter, which is a comprehensive roundup of tech news and events across Africa. Um, if you are not subscribed to it, the link to TC Daily will be shared in the chat room shortly by our chat room moderator. Now I'm going to briefly introduce, uh, introduce, excuse me, our guests and have them to just speak very quickly about um, what they do and their roles in the companies that they represent today. And then we can um, jump right into the conversation. So um, with us on the call is um, Michelle Adi. I hope I said that correctly. Um, the co-founder and CEO of Jetstream Africa, Mark Mwangi, founder and CEO of Amitrock, Louis Yaw Afo, executive director of the AFCTFA, AFCFTA Policy Network, and Tola Onayemi, CEO of Norbase. Um, so I guess you guys can unmute and introduce yourself. Um, I can start with Michelle. God, I hope I said that right. Please correct me if I'm wrong, and I will not say it correctly again. Hi, I'm Misha Addy, co-founder and CEO of Jetstream Africa. Jetstream is an e-logistics and financing company for cross-border trade. Thank you so much, Misha. Mark? Hi, hi thanks. <clears throat> My name is uh, Mark Mwangi. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Amitrak, a uh, digital platform that seeks to connect uh, shippers to transporters in a fair, transparent, and efficient manner. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Lewis? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mishi. And uh, good morning, co um, colleagues. My name is Lewis. I'm a trade practitioner and an after expert. An executive director of APN Group. We focus on uh, after, and we focus on also on investment, and then women uh, empowerment in terms of trade. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, Tola. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Tola Noemi, um, international trade and investment lawyer. Um, previously, as stand chief negotiator for Nigeria one of the lead negotiators for the AFCFTA, and now um, building a company called Norbase that helps you start in any African country um, from a single platform. Thank you so much, Tola. Okay, I believe we can jump right in since we already started off pretty late. By the way, I just realized I did not introduce myself. My name is Cora Mane Correa. I am Tech About's Managing Editor. Okay, now we can start. Um, so I'm gonna start with Misha first. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions and then work my way down the list. Um, so in your opinion, how has the pandemic impacted trade and logistics in Africa? So can you speak a little bit to some of the trends that you saw um, come into play during COVID slash after the pandemic? Yeah, so the type of trade that we deal with is regional and global trade. So we saw a complete meltdown of global supply chains. That meltdown was in some cases caused by uh, government decisions to shut down certain ports um, that are critical in the movement of cargo, especially in China, which as many of you probably know is Africa's biggest trading partner on the import side. There were also changes in the type of cargo that was being moved into Africa, uh, a shift from um, electronics toward more pharmaceuticals and healthcare imports that we saw in our own business. 
But I think the long-term impact, the ripple effect that's most meaningful uh, beyond logistics is the um, effect of uh, the economic situation on our economies. So currency devaluation has been massive in Nigeria and in Ghana. We've seen tremendous inflation all over the world, including in the West, as a result of some of the COVID relief programs that governments implemented. And those uh, currency issues and those economic issues make it more difficult for importers and exporters to trade and for people moving cargo domestically, people who buy and sell things domestically to run their businesses. Thank you so much for that response. Um, just to sort of go along in that conversation, let's talk a little bit about um, Jetstream Africa, right? So you guys launched a little over a year before the pandemic kicked in. Can you talk about some ways that the pandemic impacted your business operations and what new things did it tell you about the market um, after, especially I guess a year after your launch, um, you know, the pandemic hit. So yeah, so what did you kind of see? What did you learn? What lessons did you learn? And what kind of um, challenges did you even face um, when the pandemic hit? So for our part, we, we do something that's called digital, quote unquote, digital freight forwarding, which means that we use technology to accelerate the process of moving goods from A to B and securing financing, making payments all along the way in that process. So during the COVID period, our sales actually tripled because a lot of the traditional um, shipping processes that people were using weren't working anymore. So the advantage of being a digital or a tech enabled logistics company deepened during COVID. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And can you um, speak a little bit into um, what kind of tech enabled solutions Jetstream Africa currently um, uses or is leveraging right now? Yes, so we have three divisions to our company. We have a division called Jet Logistics, which moves cargo from A to B. We have a division called Jet Finance, which offers trade financing to people who want to import and export cargo. And we have a division called Jet Vision, which enables enhanced cargo tracking. So people know not just where physically their cargo is, but if there is an issue in customs, what specifically the issue is and it enables them to fill out a lot of the paperwork that's required to pass through customs in a country. It automates and standardizes the process of collecting that paperwork. So the technology pieces of our business really revolve around enabling vendors, people who provide logistics services, as well as customs brokers, et cetera, to be paid up front. And we take money from our customers 45 days about after a shipment is delivered. So we basically provide them working capital so they can run their shipments when they need to rather than when they have cash. The other technology component of our platform is really around that enhanced cargo tracking and the ability to fill out forms automatically, which is only possible with technology. Thank you so much um, for that clarification. Um, what would you say are the biggest problems with logistics in Africa? Um, why do you think it's so difficult to move goods between African countries? So the, the number one problem, and I, I don't like to be shy about this at all, is infrastructure. If there were better connectivity between the really fragmented um, economies and even within certain countries, the ability to transit trade from the bottom of the country where the port is to the top of the country where often a lot of agriculture is produced, the investment in infrastructure would be a tremendous boost to um, the acceleration of trade. That being said, I think in many of our countries, many of the countries that we live in here on the continent, we, you know, you'll be driving down the highway and you'll see a bridge literally to nowhere. And so we understand that infrastructure decisions that are not based on data are not good decisions. 
And so I would say, although there's a foundation of infrastructure that's missing on the continent, beneath that foundation is a need for better data and information on market sizes, on trade flows, on capacity uh, constraints that carriers, truck drivers, ship operators, airlines have. And those uh, data points can help governments and private parties make better decisions about where to invest in infrastructure. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just ask, I mean, just going off of this conversation, I just want to segue to Mark and ask, um, what inefficiencies did you observe in the logistics sector when you moved to Nairobi? And how did those inefficiencies inspire the Amitruck journey? Yeah, so, um, uh, so uh, Amitruck connects transporters directly with um, cargo owners. And I guess the inception of the idea came from um, understanding the role that middlemen generally informal middlemen play um, by con when they connect a load with a vehicle uh, and they do so informally, which makes it susceptible to all sorts of risks. Um, so there's a risk that payment might not be made. Uh, there's a risk that some misinformation in terms of destination costs um, are, are done. There are some challenges for the transporter with regards to working capital. Uh, there are challenges for the cargo owner with regards to security of the goods um, and also in terms of comparing across different suppliers and understanding what kind of service and quality they can get. So what, the, what digital allowed us to do was to connect at scale uh, a large number of uh, transporters to a large number of shippers and enable them to agree on price in a secure uh, and secure not just their, their, the payments, but secure the load and ensure the whole process is very efficient. So that, that that's basically was the, 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 the inception of the idea. Thank you so much. That's a really great response. Um, so in the year, it's been over two years since Amit Truck formally launched. How would you say the industry has changed since then based on your own observations? Yeah, I, I, I don't think um, we've definitely had some uh, nice wins and, and we've scaled, but uh, we've barely scratched the surface of the challenges we see in the market. Um, I'd say uh, the changes that I experienced uh, are mostly uh, the market changes rather than changes we've affected uh, in, in changing the, the, the landscape of the African transport market. And I think these are changes that are obvious to everybody. Um, the challenges that we see in the market are things such as um, the high cost of fuel, uh, the fragmented supplier base, uh, difficulty making cross-border digital payments, um, the lack of harmonization of governance. So how do you recover debt in country A compared to country B? Um, uh, security of your goods and, and payments. Um, and these are maybe some of the more softer infrastructure gaps that we haven't yet addressed uh, as, as a continent. Thank you so much. Um, and then my third question for you is, um, how do you think innovation support, how do you think, or how can innovation support the development of Africa's transport sector and supply chains? So what innovative solutions do you think that we should be exploring to help solve whatever issues or inefficiencies um, this sector is currently experiencing? I think when you look at the challenges that I just mentioned, so something like payments across borders, we have a lot of digital payment providers that are now coming in to innovate. Um, if you look at things like a fragmented supply base for, uh, of transporters, there are digital platforms such as Amitrack that are here to consolidate that. So when I think about what is, where is the innovation needed in order to see a step change uh, from technology, it's actually the more social uh, regulatory innovation kind of thing we need to do. Um, so we, we need to embrace things such as the African Free Trade Zone Agreement. Uh, we need to harmonize things like border crossings. So this is a, is, is a huge, uh, as you go from country to country, the requirements are very different, the requirements of paperwork, uh, the customs uh, checks are very different. Um, when we think about things such as bank um, uh, bank controls, uh, those are very different from state to state. Uh, road regulations, permit requirements, those are very different. So it's that layer that makes it really difficult and technology can help by allowing for those differences across 
different places. But I mean, to make it faster, having some harmony or some common themes uh, regionally would make things a lot easier for uh, innovators in the space. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and now I'm just going to ask Lewis some questions. Um, Lewis, can you speak a little bit more into the vision of the AFCFTA with regard to driving sustainable development in Pan-African trade and logistics? Well, I think, uh, thank you for the opportunity and good morning again to your viewers, listeners, and colleagues. I mean, currently at the implementation stage of the ASCFTA, I think currently they have itemized five very strategic areas they would like to implement this year. And one of them is um, logistics, transport and logistics, pharmaceuticals, agribusiness, and automotive industry. And then also the uh, looking at ICT. Now, you will now understand that if you produce the goods and there is no transport and logistics, it's as better of not producing at all. Because there's a need for the goods and services to reach the final destination, the consumer. And I think one of the, the Achilles heels that we have been having in Africa, in all our trade, whether free trade or not after, is our transportation and logistics as a whole. There are so many, uh, 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 a lot of, uh, what do you call it, percentage of funding that must go into logistics. If you come to the AFTA agreement, you look at what we call the boosting into African trade. That is the pillars of how to know whether an African economy is really doing well under AFTA. One of them is trade-related infrastructure. And trade-related infrastructure is how you finance your infrastructure, which includes logistics. Then also when you come to trade facilitation, the same. So you have two key pillars under after agreement, which is which needs great attention. That is a trade facilitation and then trade related infrastructure. So if people or if governments will commit resources and funding to infrastructure, especially logistics and transport, then I can tell you that it will make doing business within the agreement, within the free trade area, more better than it, it, it was. I don't want to go into the, uh, uh, the we, we'll, we'll get there in terms of the difficulties, but like uh, Mishi opened the, 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 the conversation, they are poor infrastructure. Either we decide not to fund it at all. And in any case, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is like a leak for countries to do well within the specified uh, 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 areas of implementation, so that if you are not you are not waiting for the secretariat to come uh, give you instructions, do this, do that. No, the various member states are supposed to look within their own economic setup and see what do we have to do to get these goods to the consumer. How do we have to do it? And then you're going to look at packaging, you're going to look at inventory, you're going to look at uh, information, you're going to look at distribution. So logistics is broad. And in all the pillars within logistics, we are still lagging behind. Thank you so much for that detailed response. Um, I do have to ask, you know, just to piggyback on this vision that you've shared with us, how much of this vision do you think has been actualized since the act was set up? The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is in its second year of trading, but the reality is that trading has not started. Uh, it is it is emotion. It doesn't start because the rules of origin that is needed to kickstart it is almost about uh, getting to eighty seven point one three. I'm sure by the end of the by end of August, I'm sure that it will be they will go with the, what they've done. And so we have not traded to test the waters, but even before we trade, the difficulty is that we are there, there are some customary or there are custom procedures or custom issues because uh, we did harmonization of some of these practices, common uh, custom operations. Whatever you see happening at the ports or uh, the, uh, of Nigeria should be the same happening in Ghana. We have not reached that yet. So sometimes it's like you go, you, you go to one country and tell us, oh, I don't know anything about after products. I don't know anything about 
uh, I'm not sure uh, we have not even uh, inserted these in our windows uh, when our, uh, what do you call it our custom windows or uh, single windows. A critical example is that even the day that after was uh, 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 test drive or you realize that Ghana exported some goods to South Africa, the goods were there for almost about three weeks, okay, before even the customs realized whatever was going on. Currently, as I'm speaking to, there are many other countries within AFTA member states who are yet to have legislative instruments operationalizing the custom procedures under AFTA. And so even if a custom, even if logistics are available now, and then we are not yet ready with customs procedures or legislative instruments backing our custom procedures, we'll still have to uh, uh, wait a bit longer. However, the good news is that, as I said, the, what I know is that the Secretariat is ready to trade with member states come uh, uh, by the end of I think July or August. And so this is where uh, uh, trading is. It hasn't started fully yet, but all the things that need for them to uh, uh, operationalize, I think they are by 87.13%. Thank you so much. And um, my final question before I move on to Tola is um, just around um, the agreement promising to be a crucial driver for industrialization, trade, and economic growth in Africa. Um, in your own opinion, what are the current roadblocks that stand in the way of um, this promise um, you know, coming to fruition? Like I indicated, if I want to start with the roadblocks, it starts with the member state themselves. What they want to negotiate, they should ensure that they implement it. Nobody forced them to sign the agreement. They signed willfully. So one, the will to implement is the first block. Secondly, no country should be left behind. In other words, it is not a race. We are supposed to intra-trade, therefore, we need to build upon our comparative advantages. If we are within the same uh, sub-region, for example, West Africa, Kuwait, and Nigeria can supply Ghana with salt, why will, well, if Ghana can supply Nigeria with salt, why will Nigeria import outside Africa? Why don't Nigeria benefit the comparative advantage that Ghana has in terms of salt? In the same way, if Ghana has to import maybe wheat and Nigeria can provide, this kind of comparative advantages that we ignore it's also a block because these are the realities on the ground. We know very well that this neighbor country can supply this, can provide this, yet we bypass and go beyond and go and import it from outside Africa. How would that agreement survive? Again, one of the things we also have to look at is customs, like I said. Are all these that we are saying, if the entry points, the borders and the customs are not really harmonized and really regulated and capacity building are organized for the members, it will be like everybody's on an island. So there is a need for legislative instruments among member states to really, you know, uh, uh, hasten issues, speed up issues, scale up issues and activities, and then also make sure that by this time, most of their clearance or most of their uh, 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 single windows have after codes or after products so that when goods are coming, uh, the custom officer then knows that ah, these are after goods. Immediately, he goes to the courts. So without doing that, this kind of uh, lack of legislative instrument backing and operationalizing custom operations and management will be a, a, a stumbling block. And then finally, we are not done in terms of sensitization yet. We assume, in fact, we assume that we have sensitized and everybody knows about that. No, if you ask me, a sensitization in Africa as a whole, will be about 45% when it comes to what after is. You are dealing with a free trade space that you want everybody to participate. And therefore, it is our responsibility to make sure that all the member states have instituted agencies and institutions who are going to sensitize the people, the associations, the trade groups about what after is and what it brings. Just one of programs are not enough. We need to really go down to the grounds have certain even directories, uh, manuals, to let people understand, even in their own language. These are some of the uh, you know, uh, uh, immediate uh, setbacks or immediate uh, uh, barriers that I, I, I can really point out.
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that, Lewis. Um, so for you, Tola, my first question is around existing interregional interregional nuances that make intracontinental trade difficult in Africa. Can you shed some light on what some of these nuances are? Um, thanks a lot, um, KK. Um, and thanks to Techbao for the invitations and um, the other panelists. Um, so I, th I think I'll start from the beginning, right? Which is that, and I, and I think COVID put that in perspective more than any other time, is that um, today we have these 1.2 billion people that make up Africa, um, an economy of $3 trillion, right? What you find out in actual reality is that it's 54 countries, um, 41 currencies, right? Um, some landlord countries, some seaport countries that don't have um, good ports or have congested ports. And so what you experience uh, from the point of trade on the continent is 54 different regimes, right? You have to deal with 54 different countries who have 41 different currencies on how they want to do trade, right? And so what you see happen a number of times that you're trying to do trade across the continent, you first also have an information dissymmetry, right? So you first have to find the person you want to do trade with in the country. So let's say you decided, I want, to, I want to buy something from South Africa. You first need to wade through all the logistics of, do I even know I can trust somebody here? How do I verify this company exists? All that kind of things, right? So let's say you find someone eventually in South Africa after you spend several weeks, right? There's no standards, right, across the continent. So you don't have a, a standard infrastructure of, oh, what's the standard? Is it an ISO? You don't have the standards. You're probably going to use European standards, right? Which don't know you works, right? Um, for your own specific scenario. But let's say you find a way to sort that out, right? You find, you order it in, eventually, right? Um, there's also the part that logistics are being broken, right? So the question is, why are you going to get the product you've finally, tr you're trying to pay for from South Africa to Nigeria? Then payment becomes a big problem. How do you pay? Um, right? Today, there's no clear payment. So maybe you go to speak to your banks. Your bank gives you a lot of runarounds. Let's say eventually you find out one of the new payment infrastructure, and fintechs or whatever it is you can use to try and make payments. You try and figure it out. That's, that's another few weeks gone, right? Then the next thing that comes, look, how, how do I get the products from that country to mine? Do I go by ship? Oh, maybe there's no direct shipping line. Oh, do I fly it out? Oh, that's ridiculous, expensive. That means I would not make any profit. Oh, do I take it by road? There's no direct um, road highway track from South Africa to Nigeria. So you're stuck. So what happens eventually is that maybe you're stuck with shipping the product through Europe down to Nigeria, right? Or you say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to fly it in. Whatever way you decide. Let's say, let's say, let's say you decide to use the port somehow. Right? It means maybe you do two, it touches down in two places before it gets down to Nigeria. Eventually it gets down to Nigeria, now you're at the port, right? You're trying to clear it, right? You spend several days trying to clear it. No one cares. The difficulty you face for shipping from Europe and from, from South Africa is as, as same as you, it's probably even more than if you had just bought something from the United Kingdom, right? Um, and so what happens next is you deal with all that logistics about oh, trying to clear your, you can't hear me? Someone said they can't hear me. Can you hear no, me? Or... I can hear you just fine. It, it might be a network issue on the end. Yeah, yeah, please okay. go on. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So you 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 go through all that process, and then you're trying to clear your product. Eventually, your product gets cleared. Now, just to get your product from South Africa to Nigeria, you probably spent three months, four months, five months. So the question is, why should I bother trying to buy my product from another African country when I can just buy from the UK or Europe and get it in a matter of days? And and all that you learn is that. The historical trading routes with most African countries in their colonial um, history, historical countries are stronger than more African countries. It's easier to get things from France to Francophone Africa than it is to get them to Nigeria. Cote d'Ivoire is close to Nigeria, but it's easier to get things from France to Cote d'Ivoire than it is from Cote d'Ivoire to Nigeria because the routes just don't exist. They're not built to do trade. Today, trade in Africa is under 3%, right? Inter-African trade is under 3%. And so that's the kind of experience you face where you're struggling with information, you're struggling with professionals to work with, you're struggling with logistics, you're struggling with payments, you're struggling with clearing, you're struggling with identifying, you're struggling with standards. And those are the, all those people stack on each other when you want to trade across the continent. So the other part to that is that you're also dealing with a lot of cultural nuances, right? Language, language differences, currency differences. So for instance, you probably have to change your money from Naira to dollars to back to Rand. Just And the problem with that is you've lost 
time, you lost money three times, right? You lost money when you're trying to change money from dollars to rand and to and to and naira to dollars. And you're gonna lose it again when you're trying to move it from Nigeria to the US. You're gonna lose it to South Africa. You're gonna lose it again when you're trying to change money from from um, from USD to rand. And so all that logistics is what people trying to trade across the continent face. And that's why most people just say, you know what, why go through all that stress when I can just buy from Europe, right? Or buy from um, a country that have an historical past to it. And that's the general experience that businesses face um, when they're trying to trade across the continent. You've got 54 countries, 54 standards, 54 different rules. And the same thing happens when you're trying to even do business on the continent, right? 54 countries that have 54 different systems of starting businesses, of, um, of, of getting payments across, one country wants you to have a resident director, another one doesn't care, they just want you to have a nominee director, they just want you to have a local um, shareholder, and now wants you to satisfy a um, protectionist policy. It's just divergent rules to do trade on the continent. Thank you so much, Tola. A really in-depth response. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, so my second question is, um, how do, so logistics and trade are two of the things around which the growth of Africa's digital um, economy is centered, right? How do these currently intersect with policy? And what are lawmakers missing when it comes to developing these segments, these um, so logistics and trade, right? Um, how are we thinking about policy? And then what, when you think about what lawmakers are missing out, can you tell us a bit more of the, like, can you speak a little bit more into the areas that they should actually be focusing on, right? And amplifying in the process. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, and I think um, it was already mentioned, a good part of it is infrastructure, right? I think what's happening today is there's a lot of high level talk about trade and policy that is not backed by infrastructure. So for instance, if you agree, so if you want to create prosperity, ridiculous prosperity, right? You need a large market. That's the first rule. You need, in fact, you need two things. You need a large market, you need predictable rules, right? And why is that important, right? So today, KK, if you wanted to start a burger chain, or if you wanted to start a weak company, or you wanted to start an eyelash company in, in, in California alone, you can build a $2 billion business, in just California. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have to leave California. The reason is that it's a large market with disposable income, right? If you try to do that with name in Africa, you kind of have to get into 10 countries to get a, like, that's why all our African unicorns are in more than one market, right? Like, you almost cannot point to any unicorn in Africa that is in just one market or just one city it's act, or just one state. It's actually incredibly impossible because you need a large market. Now, and so what's not happening is, so, so we know that. And so a lot of time we do all this formula, uh, policy formulation where we say things like, oh, we need access to a large market. We're going to make Africa a single market. And I worked on that. I worked on the AFCFT negotiations. I led it. I was asked, I was a search of negotiation for Nigeria, right? So I worked on that. But what we're missing is we're doing all this broad policy objectives, setting out all these broad policy terms without saying, what does that mean on the practical term for a business? So for instance, if I'm a business today, how do I get my products from A to B, right? And what policymakers need to do is work with actual business people to actually route the real process. Meaning, listen, why do we have a super highway from South Africa to Nigeria today, right? What are all the countries in between it? How do we get a super highway, right? Because what that means is that you can bring the cost of production down. You can bring the cost of moving people down a lot. Why don't we have a ease, ease of moving people around? Because trade moves when people move, right? So why is it still incredibly hard to get visas across these countries? Why exactly is it that we don't have a dredge deep, in, 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 in maybe what you call an, in, 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 an inter, in a West African inter, in, in, in inter waterways, where even within West Africa alone, you can move things through the waters because it's cheaper. It's always cheaper to move things by the waters, right? And so what you want is people saying, listen, this is the map of Africa or this is Africa. These are the strategic infrastructure that we need to exist. An highway here, an highway here. Right. And so instead of building all these big projects that we all shout all over the day and say things like, oh, we've caught a new, we've caught the, we, we, we've built a new um, stadium. Yeah. But is the stadium going to boost trade? Right. And it's not bad to have a stadium. I'm pro stadium, I'm pro sports. But the question is, is building a stadium in the middle of a city going to bring the same economic output as if five countries agree together to get an AFDB loan or AFDB investment to build a super highway between them? Right? Or, and how do we even fund the highways, right? Can we come up with a system that funds the highways even from maybe private sector contributions? So the questions are, those are the big things we need to think about. Questions like, okay, 
Do we have a nice standards for setting up businesses? So for instance, today, there are 54 countries in Africa. To do business in 54 countries, you need to set up 54 different countries, companies. What do we come up with a system? And that's one of the things that Norbase is trying to do, right? Where you say, listen, I can register one company in Nigeria and my company can get automatically recognized when I move into South Africa. Why do I have to register again? Why can't the Nigerian Corporate Affairs Commission share my company information automatically with the South African authorities? The moment I set up in South Africa, can I have a cross recognition of, of companies once I move across borders, right? Or even how do I verify? How do I know that this company really exists? Do we need to have a central database of, 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 of companies across the continent? Do you have a, need, to, need to have an Africa-wide registry of companies, right? Even capital. For instance, there's something the government of Thailand does. The government of Thailand says if you want to start food restaurants anywhere in the world, they'll give you a capital loan. So do we need to have an Africa-type loan where, where, you, where your banks are to tell you things like, listen, as long as your investment is within Africa, you get a slower digit of investment, um, of, of capital, to certify people to do those kind of things. The question is, what are the th missing pieces of infrastructure, of capital, of business practices that we need to, for instance, sports? Do we need to start saying things like, listen, the moment, that's what ASN is trying to do, right? That the moment you enter a port and you identify that, listen, I am an African product, I'm an African company, I get professional regime. That's what happens in the EU. The moment you say you're from within the, you're an EU type company, it's almost like you're a local, right? In that regime. Those are the big things that we need to start thinking about. Those big, broad ideas that we need to implement. Big, broad strokes of saying, how do I ensure that anyone who has an African origin as a company or as a business enjoys an Africa-wide experience in any African country they step up into? from access to ports, to concession, to even licensing regimes. Do we need to start talking about licensed passports? Where I say, the moment I have satisfied a licensing regime in one country, and I show up in another country, I can show my passport regime and say, oh, I'm already registered by the Central Bank of Nigeria to do FinTech licensing. And that, or oh, even standards, even agreeing on standards alone, to say, listen, what are standards around data protection? What are standards again around, around, um, around licensing? What are standards, and can we agree? Because what that means is this, if seven, 10 regulators agree to one set of standards, what it means is that I don't have to worry whether this person coming from South Africa or from Ghana or from Zambia satisfies the requirement because I know that I have the same standard in this country. And so I can do a passport regime even faster. Those are the big, broad ideas we should be thinking about. Thank you so much, Tola. Um, Mark, I see your hand is up. Would you like to contribute to what Tola just said? Yeah, I would, and um, I feel very strongly about this as a topic. I, I think I would, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with him, but I want to develop the discussion even further. I want to give two quick examples. So uh, the global car tire market is um, something like 250 billion. 65% of rubber, which is a critical component of this uh, product, comes from Liberia. Liberia's GDP is three, 3 billion. Um, I can do the same for Kenya, where I live, we're a big producer of tea. Uh, an acre of tea produces roughly 50,000 cups. Uh, a cup in Starbucks is $5. These guys are making $75 an acre. <laughs> so you're keeping less than 1% of the value chain of what you have. And I think sometimes when you look at what needs to happen, the effort looks like it's a lot. But if you think of the value you get from doing the value add locally, you actually retain a lot more value. Africa was set up, um, not to go into colonialism or anything, but it was set up as an extractive economy. So we give raw materials with cheap labor and then we buy back produce goods. But you know, for Liberia, for example, a good idea would be to make a tire for bicycles and bikes that are used in Africa for African markets where they can keep all the marketing, they can keep the accounting, they can keep the manufacturing and all those profits would then possibly see the GDP per capita significantly improve. So I think the component that we miss, the only way we move from being an extractive, almost if you like, um, cheap source of raw material to becoming a industrialized uh, continent where we keep a lot of the income we, that, that our raw materials produce is if the first step is to actually make cheap products that are used locally and then grow and become big enough so we can debate on the international stage. It's a bit like training in your gym to box before going to fight Mike Tyson on the global stage. We first develop here, we, just like China did, just like India did. And actually, if you go back to North America, um, when Ford initially did the, 
the, the initial Ford uh, motor car, it first sold in North America and then it became global. And we have to do that as well for Africa to really develop. That, that, that was just the point I wanted to make. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for jumping in there. Um, <clears throat> now, well, I'm sure we've, like, this has been such an insightful conversation. We're going to move into the audience Q&A portion of this um, conversation. And I'm going to invite my colleague, Lanre, to um, lead that conversation. Um, so when people were signing up for this event, we asked them to send in some questions to ask um, our panelists here. And so Lanre is going to walk through some of those questions. Um, let me just confirm is, if he's in. Hi, Lanre. Okay, great. Um, Hi, everyone. Okay. Hi, Lanre. Yes, we can Hi, hear everyone. you just fine. Yeah, no problem. I think we've lost Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, Lanry, we can okay, hear you. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Karimone, and thank you to all the panelists. And I'm just going to dive into the questions from the audience. Um, to the sense, this sentence, some of these questions are ahead of the call, um, but we're also going to take some questions in the, from the Q&A box. So um, the first question, let me see. Oh, okay, I like this one. Um, how can young startups, um, the present parliament, early stage startups, take a huge bite of Africa's logistics problem? Um, and I don't know, anyone can volunteer to take that question? Yeah. Michelle, do you wanna, do you wanna try? Yes, I mean, I think one of the, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. One of the, I think, important contributions that uh, local startups can make to logistics is really in aggregation. And um, Amitrak is doing that. There are many other startups on the African continent which are taking the fragmented logistics industry and helping to consolidate it or at least harmonize it so it works together. I think that's the first area. Um, that it's possible to add value in without a lot of capital. You don't actually have to buy trucks. You don't actually have to buy warehouses. Coordinating and helping cargo owners understand what the capacity is of existing assets is a huge value add. To give an example, at the port of Tema in Ghana, there are many warehouses that sit empty. They're vacant. And there's an over capacity problem that many people don't know about. So when a cargo owner is looking to store goods uh, after they are imported or before they're exported, they struggle to figure out the price and the availability and the location of storage for those goods, even though there's too much warehouse space available. So technology oriented startups have a huge role to play in surveying all of the assets that already exist and revealing data about what their capacity utilization is what their pricing should be and that's the type of thing that benefits both the asset owner and the person who wants to do business with trade okay Thank you, Michelle. Tola, did you want to answer that as well? Yeah. Bit of, and I love how uh, Michelle has put that context. I think four things I was going to say in broad strokes. I think the first thing is, um, is to look at it as a micro problem instead of a macro problem. So I think what happens a number of times in people Africa's problem is that you get overwhelmed because you get sucked in in how big it is and how many things there is to do. I think one of the things that Misha says that I just want to double, double click on is, listen, you want to think about the smallest portion of it that you can deliver quick value on, right? So for instance, things as basic as last mile delivery is a big deal. It's probably one of the biggest deals in logistics on the continent, just last mile delivery, right? Meaning, listen, or even addressing, right? Like how do I, addresses in the continent are bad, right? Like, like in, in the US or in the UK, you can just send a postcode and they'll find you, right? Addressing the continent is bad, right? And so thinking of the smaller things that you can do 
is one big thing. The second thing is think of it in local context. So for instance, just solving a problem for your own local market in a small child with children. So for instance, we'll have fixes addressing in Nigeria is going to make a big deal of money, right? So that just fixes addressing in Ghana is going to make a lot of money, right? Because addressing is just bad. That's the second thing I'm going to say. The third broad stroke I was going to say for startups is just a lot of connectivity. I think we need, I think we'll get to the point. I think in the logistics story, we're going to start with a story of, and that's what happened in Europe also, right? You're going to have a story of first local solutions, then we're going to have aggregated solutions that lay on top of those local. So for instance, I think what's going to happen first is that someone's going to have to figure out trucking across a region. Then the next place of it will be people that sort out things like trucking, even just within a country. Then the maybe third place of it will be people that will build things that listen. I don't have a truck, but I know how to get into the database of the trucks in Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, and just a super app on top of them that aggregates all of that. That's like a third big thing, right? But I think to get there, we need like the smaller trucks in different countries. And I think the last um, thing I was going to say, the fourth broad stroke I was going to say, is that you want to think about it in a, you want to think about it in a, um, in, in the economics of it, like what economics works for people, right? So for instance, the question becomes, what if I got the product into the country for you cheaper, but you paid for your last mile delivery? So like, you don't think of the economics, because you know, with, with Nigeria as against most other countries is that there is not as much venture capital to throw into solving logistics problem, but at the same time, there's a lower disposable income, right, on the continent. So you want to think of it in the economics of it also, like what economic scales across the continent and how does it work? For instance, one way someone could think about it is that, what if we just revitalize it? The PO box system, right? Even in the in the U, U, um, in the UK, right? One thing they do a lot is that, that the DPD does a lot is having, and even Amazon does a lot is having drop off points. So, for instance, if logistics is difficult, what if I just have people say, "Listen, you can ship anything in, but in every region, I'm going to have a drop off point that you can go and pick up from, right?" And those kind of like interesting things are things that, and those are all incredible logistic solutions. That, but the broad stroke is think local, think. Um, think local, think of the economics of it, think of it in small chunks in your own country, and then think of it in super aggregated. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Tola. Um, I see um, attendees raising their hands. Please, um, you can start typing your questions into the QA box. I will take those questions. Um, just Let me be a little. Yeah, Louis. I can see your hand up. I will, I will, I will give you a chance to, to go now. I just, I just wanted to make an announcement. I think an announcement. Okay, so please type in your questions into the Q and A box, and I will take them um, after the call. I'm sorry, while we're like during the event, just after we're done with some of the questions I'm, I'm um, reading out to the, to the speakers right now. Um, yeah, the other thing is. We will also call up some um, attendees to ask your questions directly or to clarify if it would be. Um, so, yeah, Lewis, please. Yes, I wanted to add a bit to what I've been said. For a, if you are a startup and you are more than five years, you should know you are not a startup. If, if, the, if the content, of the, if the context in which we call startups, sometimes somebody would have been for six years and we still call the, the, the open a startup. No. If you are a startup within the logistics stream, like Mishi said, we should look beyond transportation, which has always taken uh, the chunk of what logistics really stand for. We should look at the information part of logistics. We should look at the inventory type of logistics. So connecting it to what Mishi said, if it comes to inventory, you're looking at the stock, the commodities available that must reach the consumer. You should look at supplies itself. You should look at warehouses. In this case, when you look at intra-African trade, it is not only the final exporter who is supposed to gain from this uh, uh, intra-African trade or uh, African continental trade. It is a chain. So startups can take up some of the exportable chains. You might not be the one that will finally export the commodity, but you can build around technology. You can build around formation. You can build around so many within these chains before the goods get to uh, the final exporter. What are some of the various connections, the dots that can connect and where you can pitch your business. If you take information, like Mishi said, if you are building a tech information system, come from that angle. If you are building a distribution system, if you come to Ghana, for example, there are so many ways of distribution. 
that young uh, startups have pitched themselves to be able to convey, if you take distribution goods to set certain points, then it continues from there. So look at the chains within that sector and be able to pitch which one you feel that you, are, you have the capacity at the moment. Thank you. Hello, Louis. Were you done speaking? Yes, thank you. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I think just um, this, these are very interesting recommendations. Um, I think Tola, while while you were speaking, something that crossed my mind that you touched on was one of the arguments might be, you know, how do I fund you know, a logistics startup? <laughs> you know, I mean, fintech is still the is still the baby of investors are uh, the most attractive sector um, because I do know that they are addressing some addressing startups. There are a lot of them. There is OK already, OKHI, and I'm sure there's at least one, one or two more. Um, so again, in a country like Nigeria, for example, or in some other African countries where government likes to interfere, you know, what, what, what happens when you start and addressing startup and government decides that you know what we also want to do addressing <laughs> you know so like how do you how do you um approach things like that and there's a question actually you know just because the question is related to this i think the person is saying you know how do they pitch to angel investors the opportunities that exist in the logistics space so to allow you, you can just take um boots thanks a lot yeah, i think one of the questions together i think one of the biggest advantages with logistics startups right that is a cash is a cash for right unlike fintech fintech is a is future money in a sense right like today a lot of investors invest in fintech i invest in fintech right but the thing is when you're trying to do a fintech you're saying i'm going to get a customer i'm going to provide financial services to you and i'm going to make money from it long term logistics is not that logistics means someone's going to pay for it today right today whenever you see someone you're doing a logistics like someone pays you money today the beautiful thing with trade startups generally that people are willing to pay for it today, right? Like from shipping to trucking, people are paying. It's a cash-based business. So the way I think of it is, what you want to do is, and so listen, there is a scarcity of things to invest in on the continent. There's a lot of gunpowder, there's a lot of capital people want to invest, right? The real question is, can you prove that that business is scalable and viable enough in a small, fast enough way? And what I tell people is that, listen, no matter how much if you think of this idea, what you want to think of is maybe three things. The first is, can I do a very micro pilot of it to show traction and to show a lot of out? And that's, that's the biggest advantage of logistics startups. Unlike fintech where you can throw an idea because it's the boss, you kind of have to prove some viability around it. Like, can I prove do something small that shows viability? The second big question is, that comes to credit really important how you, have, you know you approach it, is that can I embed myself into a bigger institution, right? Because the logistics is, is you get a lot of runway if you embed yourself in logistics. So for instance, if for instance today Junior starts using as an addressing system, that's a big load of money. Right. So, like, who is the biggest person that I can embed myself into to use? Amazon said they're going to come to address 2023. They're going to face logistics problems. Somebody's going to build something today that maybe Amazon's going to buy in 2023 because they don't have to address on, on, on in different countries, right? That's another, another big thing. And so the, the story you want to tell is one, how do I get some traction? And it's only very small. I'll use an example. Let's say I build up a very simple addressing app. What it is, it takes your address and uses Google Maps to convert it to maybe a short code, right? That looks like a postcode, right? Something very API call. It means that all I'm spending money on is API calls and, um, and cloud and all that engineering. I go meet a junior. I try and embed and say, listen, junior, it's voluntary for now. If we'll come to buy your product, tell them that, listen, they can, as they fill the address, they can just click one button that says, do you want an I don't know. You want a Larry address. Maybe it's called the start of Larry. You want a Larry address and I click and it's free. At first, it looks all cheap, right? It's not doing anything. What's going to happen is that I critically aggregate that. By the time it's 50 times fixed, or by the time I'm doing X number of transactions, I have all these Larry addresses that everybody now has, right? Because what's happened is that they've come the first time and I've given them a Larry address and I've given you one a Larry address and then you're aggregating mass over time. And what that means is that you're getting to the point where you had a short addressing system, right? The way Payments in one click. Now, but then you've got to bring good traction, right? You've got to prove that these can get a lot of volumes very, very fast. So, for instance, um, what's the way to do that? What's the way to monetize? How do I make some money out of this? Maybe what I'm going to make money out of this is tell people like, listen, if you, if you use a Larry address, 
you get X percent off. The reason you get X percent off is because the logistics company doesn't have to worry too much about how to find you anymore, right? Before, they would have to be calling people and find, but now they don't have to find you as much. Maybe a partner will, in last mile logistics company say, listen, these are my land address, I give you an address to access my APIs, right? And if you, if you, if people use your address, like I'm just giving a random example, but what you've done is you, without actually going to buy, prove the concept, right? When we're going to start Norbiz, before we ever launched, we had done about $40,000 in revenue, right? Before I ever tried to raise capital for one person, right? And the idea is that you can actually try and prove the concept over and over again. So you see it's five before you actually leave the market. But, and I can tell you this, I don't think I've known any serious logistics startup that's not got a serious capital from Cover 360 to, um, um, to lorry, you know, like it's because it's, everyone accepts that it's a big problem on the continent and it's big capital. Right, and if you figure it out, it's a big deal. Yes, thank you. Um, the questions are rolling in. I see Michelle is typing an answer already to somebody. Thank you, Michelle. Um, this question from Damola Babatunde is interesting. And Damola, if you don't mind, can we unmute you to ask this question? Because uh, it's quite long, <laughs> um, and I and I suspect you might need to clarify what exactly you're looking for with this question. Um, Damola, um, yeah, please go ahead to access question. You, you right, um, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Yes, we can. Okay, so um, my question goes as stars. I was trying to um, ask the question of how do you cater for, for instance, um, part of Africa, especially in West Africa, where you have a um, bad road network. And um, so how do you cater for efficient supply for like last mile delivery, how do you cater for that for efficient supply of goods and um, materials in an area like where you have a bad road network and also um, continuous irregular um, environmental changes like continuous rainfall and all that? Because at the end of the day, you get to disappoint customers based on the fact that you cannot reach out to them because there, there are issues with bad road network and also irregular um, um, rainfall and all of that that do not allow you get to your last mile delivery on time. That's my question. Okay, thank you. I think it's probably better. I mean, anyone can answer, but I think better suited to Mark and Misha. Do you have any thoughts, Mark? First, do you have any thoughts or experience with this? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'm not really sure. There's any way around the infrastructure. Um, I don't think there's really any way around getting the roads done. I think the way we do it is we, we don't actually dictate price to our transporters on the platform. So we actually allow transporters to bid for deliveries. And one of the benefits of that is they can account for some of the difficulties and nuances uh, that you come across in African markets that you don't come across uh, in more developed markets. So for example, uh, if you think about doing um, a, a delivery in North America, uh, you probably have a forklift, you've got good roads, you've got great warehousing, you know, the, so that, that's all. Whereas in Kenya, the, the sort of things we found our drivers uh, are pricing for are things such as it might take a lot longer to load a large truck because it's being done by hand. Uh, the road might not be uh, tarmacked. Uh, you might have uh, security issues on the way. Uh, it might be difficult to get a return trip. And by allowing this market-based price um, to be done on the platform, you can get a more informed uh, price um, as, a, as a cargo owner because you also begin to see that it's not just one transporter that is um, giving you a slightly higher price on this particular route. And as you query that more and more, you begin to understand why. So um, I think maybe the answer I should give is one of the ways startups can help with this sort of issues is not just to copy and paste what's been done in North America and in Europe and Africa, but to actually start building solutions with African market in mind and iterate to solve African problems. And then some of these things can, can, be, uh, can be bridged. But ultimately, uh, Africa should look to close the infrastructure gap so that you don't have these issues in the long run. I don't know if I answered this question. I feel like I copped out, but uh, I tried. Okay. Yamala, is that, is that satisfactory? <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, based on 
yeah, I think that that helps. Infrastructural problems should be solved to help. Um, yeah, I think that that helps a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, let me switch back to. Um, let me switch back to something about regulators because they have they have like a a huge role to play. Um, and I think again, Mark and Michelle and, and anybody else can answer this actually. But how do you mitigate risk and collaboration with the regulators in the logistics sector? Could you repeat that again? How do you mit mitigate risk and collaboration with the regulators in the logistics sector? Okay, so I, 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 I'm sure there are more big guys that can this than I do, but I, 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 but I have a bit of experience with your regulators, so I'll just try and, uh, and mention mm -hmm. them. One is that I, I think that in the logistics sector today, <laughs> it has some of the widest range of regulators, right? From the post office in some countries, right? To the customs, it's to, um, to the border control guys. It's a bunch of, it's a wide range, right? So that issue of regulator depends on where you're playing. Are you playing within countries? Are you a last mile delivery person? That's where your regulator determines. But I think the bigger real question is to figure out one, what's the incentive of your regulator and to design your solution around the incentive of your regulator. So for instance, I'll give an example. If your regulator is as an incentive to, con to do a lot of um, what they call um, control. For instance, the post office likes control. The post office likes to think they're in charge of it. And work with them, collaborate in the sense of saying, listen, we're gonna use the post office as a drop off point, right? Um, we'll build the tools you need. We'll, maybe we'll, we'll create a, like an ancillary box beside. Like, Work with them based on the interests, right, that they have. One thing I found very helpful is finding a lead key man in the regulators that is senior enough and understands enough, right? And that's what this way your investors can be very helpful in helping find somebody who is senior enough in those kind of ways, or even get an advisor that is, or even get them as an advisor, right, on your project to say, listen, this is what I'm trying to do. You have the 30 years of experience of working here. Can you come help, come as an advisor to our project to help us, you know, to help us on board? Aligning incentives is a big thing, right? Because you want to ensure that what success looks like to you and what success looks like to your regulators is the exact same thing. Also make them look good, right? When you see all this news, all this press releases where fintechs don't call out their regulators and they say, oh, it's been very helpful, that's why. Make them look good, right? Like, you know, shout them out. When you win, don't take all the credit and make it seem like you're the best things in slice bread, like give some, so give some credit to your regulators because that helps them to support, keep supporting you. And the reason is that people in the end also want to look good, right? Like if, if five years down in a row, two months in a row, the president praises us because of a certain, um, of the, if the president praises us because of a certain FinTech or a certain logistics company, the chances are that I would try and make that company succeed. Also, invest in good PR. And what I mean by good PR is that I probably, having customers that like your product, and by extension, appreciate your regulator because of that means that you're probably going to last a lot longer in the business than that. So it's, it's a it's a dance of people management, managing your the information flow, perception management, it's a mix of those kind of things. But most importantly, know what your regulator cares the most about, and that same thing. Don't don't compete with your regulator. Don't bad don't bash your regulator. Don't compete with your regulator. You know, like work with your regulator. Yeah, even even Elon Musk does not bash NASA. You know. Okay, thank you so much. Can you still hear me? <laughs> Just making sure. I, so. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Miche, Luis, I'm sorry, Miche, Mark, does anyone want to add to that? Uh, should we just move on to the next question? Yes, I mean, I think it's important for startups across the board to understand that they exist in a political ecosystem. So the idea that you can just build in the private sector and ignore uh, regulators is just not true. So um, to agree with what Tola is saying, partnerships and hiring people in your company or who can consult or advise your company who already have relationships with um, key government departments, and this is all above board ethical stuff, but can help navigate uh, through the regulations is really um, important. It took Jetstream a year to get our customs license in Ghana. And I remember complaining about how long it was taking. And uh, my co-founder said, you know what, there's a quota on how many customs licenses are granted a year. And there are people who are waiting for five years and they never get it. 
And so there are ex examples of that in every country, probably not just in logistics, in every industry, where your permission to be able to operate in that country is dependent on um, how regulators view you. Um, and it's important from the outset to think about how you can bring in advisors or consultants to start building those relationships early. Thank you, Michelle. There's a question I've been itching to get to because I also have the same questions about the, the African trade agreement, you know. Um, um, so there's a question here about why is logistics, I mean, that's probably, there are, there, are, there are probably obvious answers, you know, but I would like us to dig into this a bit more if there are layers that we don't know about that, you know, the experts um, on the panel can, can, can peel off for us. Why is logistics across Africa so complex and difficult to manage? Even with the African trade agreement, with the African trade plan, you know, I think my own part of this is when are we gonna see, you know, when are we gonna see this, this trade agreement get off the ground? When are we gonna see, you know, actual trade begin to happen? What exactly is going on, you know? Uh, can, I, can I jump in here, please? Okay, let me quickly just take, tell her, let me quickly just take uh, a comment from Luis, then, then I'll let you, then I'll let you go, go next. Yeah, yeah let me kill bed with two, uh, two beds first told. One, uh, the previous one, what I'll say is that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement has opened up in terms of what we call trading services. The trading services have liberalized transportation and under transportation you have logistics so in other words the mitigation of risk at the continental level has been factored and by liberalization they're looking at how regulatory frameworks will make doing business with ease and it has also attached the other protocol on conflict resolution and so that is an assurance which is very good a quick one on the second one you asked. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement, as I said earlier, is supposed to be implemented by members who have signed. They are stages of implementation. We are looking at one African market and it starts with free trade. The European Union started from somewhere. So it's always a process and not an event. The challenges that you are is facing the African continental free trade is, 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 is the characteristics of the first stage of entering a one African market. And some of this is what we are saying. In terms of logistics, I made clear that trade-related infrastructure is one of the pillars that members are supposed to commit resources and commit strategies and activities to it. It is not going to be a day, but if members are going to look at their institutions, like Misha said, it took one full year, which is not good. How do we review some of our legislative laws or instruments in terms of licensing, in terms of uh, uh, permits? Then again, you look at associations. Then again, you look at what is government's responsibility towards the architecture of, uh, of uh, transport and logistics. And so, all, uh, th these are things that are inbuilt in the agreement, and I think that if, if members, member states continue to follow the, 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 the structure, I think that uh, 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 with time, we'll be able to. And then finally, within that space, the agreement is promoting joint ventures among countries. For example, if you take Ghana, Ghana was trying to do rail to only the north part of Ghana. But in the coming to force of this agreement, Ghana said, look, let us have a joint project with Burkina Faso. So the rail is going to be extended as far as Burkina Faso. Can Burkina Faso also come into a joint venture capital agreement in terms of infrastructure with the neighboring country? We, we begin to do this. It takes ETS, the Ethiopian airline. They look at it and say, look, we would like to go 60, 40 with various countries who want us to be their uh, national airlines. We had that agreement with Ethiopian airlines. I don't know how far that has gone. This is one way that member states can do. There is a bridge, I don't know, the like three countries connecting the East African countries. They came together and then financed that kind of project. So I think that with logistics and infrastructure, they can be a joint approach by various member states 
because the it's a capital intensive uh, uh, sector. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Louis. Just a quick one before Tola goes. Um, if you don't mind, everyone, we're just going to take 10 extra minutes, five for questions. We're, we're getting a lot of questions, and then we'll round up at exactly 12.35, if that's fine, by everyone. Thank you so much. Um, Tola? Yeah, so what I, I think what I was going to say is that I think too often, and that's why I just wanted to talk, right? Um, I think too often people... Um, act like the AFCFT is a silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet, right? And I and I hear too many people act like, oh, when's the AFCFT is going to fix everything? It's not going to fix everything. The AFCFT is like the European Union Agreement. It's a policy framework and a law among member states. It sets out a broad context. It's like any other law. That's all. It's a law. The real big question is three. One, what are private sector going to do about the capacities that now exist under the AFCFTA. Who's building for the AFCFTA? That's why nobody exists, right? Who's building on the rails of the AFCFTA? Who's gonna take these laws and convert them into things that businesses can use? That's the first big question. Second big question is this, what are industry groups gonna to do to put pressure on their governments to comply with their own parts of the AFCFTA? Because in the end, the AFCFTA places some obligations of states, but industry groups have to work with them to implement those. The third big question, that becomes incredibly important is what exactly is the what exactly is the expansion plan of businesses, right? If we have this whole great FCFT and nobody's trading and nobody's trying to buy things from South Africa or Ghana or Nigeria or anywhere, it could as well just be a mirage. Those are the three big questions. The FCFT is not going to make you buy things from Ghana. It's not going to make you choose to buy things from South Africa. It's not going to make you import cocoa from, from Cote d'Ivoire. That entirely are business decisions. And so that's the fourth three big thing. Who's building things that people can use within the AFCFTA? Yes, it's been announced. Oh, this is now Africa-wide thing. But who's building for it? What our base does today is it ensures that if you wanted to start your company or your trademark in any African country, you don't have to go to those countries. You can stay in one place, come to our website, and register in any African country from one single platform. But who's building similar things like that for logistics? Who's building something like that for line sensing? Those are the big questions. And so the AFC is not a silver bullet. It's not going to fix every problem. If you think it's a problem the AFC does not fix, the way to think of it is, what can we do to get that done? Because the AFC has policy objectives at best. And then we need to build on the back of those policy objectives. That's just the thing I was going to say. OK. All right, thank you so much. I'm just going to take one last question from the audience. I think Misha announced and answered the question, but I thought it was an interesting one. Um, let me just get it. From Nathaniel. Um, he says, how can live tracking be crucial to mapping out the intricate layout of African countries to facilitate logistics? Misha, do you mind just repeating your answer just so everyone um, in the audience can benefit and maybe also add more thoughts to this if you if you have any additional one. Yeah, so this is a, a, an exciting question because this is where um, at Jetstream, the value of our tech really shows its head. I'll give you an example. There's a, a certain government contract, which is worth several million US dollars in Ghana, that goes out to companies that carry cocoa, the cocoa beans, um, from around the country to the port. In this contract is a requirement that every truck that's carrying these cocoa beans has a electronic tracking device on the truck so that the uh, government and the buyers know physically where the truck is at any given time. After the contract has been signed, the people who are awarded the contract, the truck brokers and, and the owner operators, carry the cocoa, they do their job, everything checks out, but the uh, ELD devices, the electronic tracking devices, seem to always be out of order. They're either turned off or they've been damaged by the weather or there's some other reason that they don't work. There's so many examples of technology from the West or from East Asia that works perfectly, but when you apply it to the ground in logistics in Africa, it stops working. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that these technologies are not designed to be used by truck drivers here. 
their smartphone apps that don't work for someone who has a feature phone and doesn't want to use his or her data. So my belief is that cargo visibility is possible in Africa. And honestly, it's the gateway to trade visibility because anything that's carried in a container is a sale, it's a transaction. And if you know what's in the container and you know how valuable it is and you know where it's going and you know who the trading partners are, you know what the trade flows are. So I think that there's a huge opportunity for data-driven trade in Africa. And I think cargo visibility is the precursor to data-driven trade. At the same time, the innovation needs to be not so much in technology, because again, there are these great off-the-shelf tracking devices. The innovation needs to be in UX design for African markets. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, Mishe. Thank you, Tola. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Luis. That's all we can take. Um, again, I apologize you know, that we started this event very late. We never start, <laughs> we never start our events even one minute late, or we hardly do that. So sorry, um, we had issues. The moderator couldn't, um, wasn't able to, to attend the last minute. But thank you for joining. This has been very, very um, interesting. Um, and yeah, we couldn't take all the questions, but um, we, we appreciate that you set them in. Um, hopefully we can do another version of this um, sometime soon. I'm just trying to buy time to get to my, um, okay. So there should have been a post survey link in the chat. Um, please fill them so that we were able to improve future events. Um, our next event is holding on July 29th, and it's back end building a product for the African market. Um, that's going to be interesting as well. If you're a product designer, if you work um, in the product management space, or even if you're a founder, or you're just um, enthusiastic about the space, please join in as well. The link for registration should be in the chat box. This event was produced by Tech About Insight. It's the research consulting uh, event um, of Tech Cabal. Um, I work on the Tech About Insight team. Shout out to Bolu, Eni, uh, Mobalaji, just everyone on the team. Thank you so much for um, producing this event. Um, yeah, there's the TC Daily newsletter. If you're not subscribed, you should definitely sign up for TC Daily. That's where you get the roundup of technology and analysis um, in the African continent. Um, thank you so much. This has been very, very um, educative and I hope it's worth your time as well. Thank you everyone and have a great day. Thanks.